Okay, hi everyone. This is Deep Learning Classics and Trends. Um, this Friday, we're covering this paper called Optformer, Tuning Hyperparameters with Transformers. Uh, we are recording, so just so you know, if you don't want your faces or voice shown, you can be careful with that. Um, without further ado, let's just get started because I know it's a uh, big paper and we have more than one authors online. I don't know how many would eventually join, but at least right now we have two, Richard and Yutian both are being here. So while Yutian is presenting, the other authors can help answer questions in the chat. So feel free to post your questions in the chat. You can also ask your questions aloud if you want to. This is a very interactive platform. Cool, and let's get started, Yutian, whenever you're ready. Hey, thanks a lot for saying. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to present our work. Uh, so yeah, as as you said, like feel free to stop me if there's anything unclear. Um, then I, I think all, more questions are welcome for that. So, uh, so this is our work is about applying a transformer model to try to learn from all the possible data that are work generated for hyperparameter optimization. So this is a joint work with a lot of my amazing colleagues at DeepMind and Google. Uh, so the, today's talk, I here I will talk about the motivation, like why we want to learn an hyperprompt optimizers from data and how to learn it and how well it works compared to other baselines. And then a quick summary and uh, about future works. So, Assuming that you are a graduate student working on a fancy new uh, deep learning network, that you have a few hyperparameters you want to optimize in order to improve the accuracy for some test functions, uh, test images. Then usually when we do this kind of tuned hyperparameter tuning, we need to do it, like try it by ourselves, like repeatedly in a sequence manner. So we might, try a few, like one set of hyperparameters for the learning rate and layer size, then train the model, observe the accuracy on the test function, or on the test set or the validation set. And then based on the observation, try another set of hyperparameters and just repeat it iteratively. So this is, um, this is a loop that we like human try to optimize some metric function with respect to the hyperparameters. This is usually considered as a black box optimization problem because we can, given any set of hyperparameter values, we only have access to the function that we can only observe, maybe sometimes a noisy observation of the model metric. We don't have the gradient information in order to do gradient descent. Uh, but usually the, uh, like we also have some metadata people don't uh, very often use. For example, if we want to tune some like ResNet model, we know the model architecture, the name of models, and, and and then uh, we know like what kind of data set we want to apply that and what kind of metric we want to optimize. Also, we know the information about the, the parameter names and the value range. So these are the meta information we could use in this hyperparameter tuning loop. Um, because we don't have a gradient descent, uh, gradient information, we cannot run the gradient descent. Historically, we rely on the graduate student to do it. So it's also sometimes known as graduate student descent. Um, so the Bayesian optimization is try to reduce this kind of human power in order to be more efficient or economical. So there's a review, amazing review called Taking the Human Out of the Loop. And uh, today our work is also part of this effort, trying to save the human's effort to tune the, auto, uh, the hyperparameters automatically. So in the traditional way to do the uh, hyperparameter tuning, like one of the most commonly used method is called Bayesian optimization. Um, for Bayesian optimization, there are two important components. The first one is a probabilist model that is used to, like, based on a few observations of the hyperparameter and the model metric pairs, we want to guess or infer the posterior distribution of the function we want to optimize, the f of x. Then, uh, one of the commonly used probabilist model is called Gaussian process. It's very data efficient in order to like kind of given very few observations, we, it allows us to infer the posterior distribution of the function value in any new location. 
Um, so another component of Bayesian optimization is that once we get the, the posterior distribution, people define an acquisition function that's defined on any new point in the hyperparameter search space, then that get, defines the a utility function. Uh, roughly, it means like what we would expect to gain if we uh, try a new set of hyperparameter and train the model. Then people usually try to design this acquisition function such that uh, the new location will likely have a high kind of posterior mean and also a large variance so that when we check that point, it's likely to uh, get a good model performance at that point. So, and the acquisition function depends on the probabilistic models because it's defined as using the posterior distribution as its input. The common assumption about Gaussian process is that it's very general. It's, it says like any function should be locally smooth. And then the smoothness is defined by the kernel. Then we have the freedom to choose what kind of kernel. But still, it's very flexible, but very general um, prior for the function we want to optimize. But if we know that we want to optimize some model's classification accuracy with respect to learning rate, and then because we have tuned these hyperparameters like repeatedly in our uh, earlier study, we have a, probably a better prior. Like if this is uh, some like ResNet or deep learning models, probably the curve of the accuracy versus the learning rate will look like a single, single mode curve where the optimal value is likely between 10 to the minus six to the 10 to the minus one, depending on what optimizers we use. So uh, if we can use uh, this kind of better prior, it will allow us to do more in efficient inference for a possible to possibly find a better uh, hyperparameter values faster than Gaussian process. So we have this kind of better prior by repeatedly tuning hyperparameter in the past. But how can we teach the machine, teach a model to learn this kind of prior? And our solution is to learn it from data. Because um, can I so many... question? Oh, there's a question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, in the traditional Bayesian optimization setting, you build a probabilistic model and then you sort of query the model to find the next best thing to try. Which step is the hardest, is, is the more expensive step? Yeah. Oh, sorry, what's your question? <laughs> uh, which step out of the two is yeah. more challenging or more expensive step? I think well, both are challenging. So like getting a good robust Gaussian process is important. And uh, there, there are a lot of research on how to build a like, better Gaussian process for the black box function we want to optimize. And there's also very rich like literature about all different kinds of design for the acquisition functions. So mm -hmm. I, I would say both components are very important. And okay. yeah. And, um, and the whole process is sort of online, right? You sort of have to you build the Gaussian process with the online data and you query it. And then you do you build another Gaussian process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the Gaussian process is efficient for like a few short inference, but then when, when we get more and more observation, it becomes like slower and slower. And then for acquisition function, because for any, uh, we need to do a global search in the entire like hyper space, search space in order to find the next point. So uh, it's well known that Gaussian process is not kind of computationally efficient when we need to try many trials in this tuning loops. Got it. Okay, thank you. So, so in order to learn a better prior, our idea is that like, because we have already collected a lot of uh, tuning experiments in the past, in both like inside Google and externally in other research groups. Um, for Google, like, there's a physics team that has been maintaining this, uh, the hyperparameter tuning service both for both the internal machine learning tuning okay. tasks and also external customers. So over years, it has, it has collected over like 16 million tuning experiments. Uh, it covers a lot a very diverse set of like machine learning tuning tasks from vision, language, speech, uh, advertisement or other optimization tasks. So um, also uh, this data is very pre precious because generating one tuning experiment means we need to repeatedly training many uh, models like one per trial. 
So what if we can learn a better prior from this, this data set, or even just directly learning a hyperparameter tuning policy? Then it will, like, for, first of all, it will allow us to do better transfer learning. Like by learning all the knowledge from the existing experiment, we may be able to tune better and faster for any future tuning task with similar, like, uh, similar task definition. And if we really have a very good knowledge about hyperparameter values, given the task description, for example, like what model I want to tune and then what they said I want to apply, we may even give some like kind of highly informative zero shot guessing for the, what the potential uh, optimal hyperparameters will, will be. That will provide a very good like starting point for tuning uh, the hyperparameters. And because, uh, the service has been running continuously and cl continuously collecting data. We this is we can consider it as a never learning task that we our knowledge will grow over time with this data set size. Eventually, we want to learn from data about anything, everything about tuning the machine learning models. So, hopefully, like I I can convince you like it will be useful if we can learn those information stored in the past existing tuning experiments, then the question is how can we learn it? So let's take a look over the structure of a tuning experiment. Can I ask a question about the data, Yutian? Sure, sure. So it is a service where people try hyperparameters there, or it probably also have algorithms that help you do hyperparameter tuning like Gaussian processes and Bayesian optimizers. Um, so I'm guessing it has the parameters that people have tried, also like the end result of that set of parameters. What other information does this data set have? Uh, so those are the main information, but usually people may also tell you like what model they want to optimize, whether it's SVM model or it's a ResNet model or RNN. Those are also useful and also like hyperparameter, what kind of hyperparameters they want to tune. Um, there may also be some side information like the tuning curve, like the, uh, the, the model's training curve. That will be another piece of like, information we could potentially use in the future. I see. Um, I'm guessing it depends so much on the model architecture that you probably cannot group data together from different architectures. Am I correct in that? Um, it's hard to say. I think there's no hard boundary like, between what can or cannot. For example, if I use SGD, Mm -hmm. No matter what model I'm tuning, I probably have some rough knowledge about what the optimal kind of range of learning rate I should use. So that kind of knowledge can transfer from tune like optimizing SVM to optimizing like the deep learning models. But if it's a question, uh, it's a it's like the size of the like some hidden layers that's not going to be useful for tuning the hyperparameters of like SV the SVM or uh, other models. So right. I think it there it's kind of a soft like boundary between like what can be shared and shared not. What about the task? Um, some people are training image nets, some are training other stuff. Do you mix yeah. data together or have them separate? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think all of this, like for human, we will have this kind of internal knowledge transfer. When we train it on image net and then we want to transfer to other data set, we probably have some good prior to guide us the, uh, to choose the hyperparameters. So I don't want to kind of hardly design like what parameter can be shared or not. I, I just want to provide as much information to the model. Hopefully model can learn some kind of internal correlation between these like priors for different tuning tasks. I see, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, as you can see, there can be very different type of uh, tuning tasks. And then in this example, for example, uh, for every tuning task, we may have some meta information as I described those like the tuning task, like what model, what data set we want to do. Then the tuning uh, process is a kind of iteratively sequential optimization problem. We will propose some parameter values. It's usually a vector of hyperparameter values. Then we observe the corresponding model performance after we train with this, this set of parameter. Then we repeat it and propose another set of parameters. So if we look at the, what the meta Mod, uh, metadata can be installed. We can have the tuning task's name. It can be any text that a user would like to provide to our service. Uh, there can be the name of the metric. It can be a single metric or multiple metrics. Uh, the direction of the optimization, 
And then sometimes the user would like to specify what tuning algorithm they would like to use. Also, uh, beside this, there can be the list of parameters. For every parameter, we will have a lot of information. So all of these are stored in some kind of semi-structured uh, data in, the, in, in our service or in our data set. And then for the uh, optimization history, it's basically a dictionary uh, that contains the parameter name and value and also the metric name and value. So as you can see, this kind of data includes both the mix of text and numeric values. And also for every tuning task, we might have different set of parameters and also the parameter dimension can change. Uh, so it's the type of the parameter. In order to handle like this kind of very complex data structure, what we propose to do is to, instead of like have the uh, vectors of parameter values in uh, at every step, we want to sequentialize everything into a single sequence. Then we convert it, everything into kind of text format. And then after we apply the, uh, the tokenization, then we get a sequence of the tokens or sequence of the integers in the vocabulary. So for example, the, for the metadata, we just basically just do a very simple kind of cleanings and provide it as pure text, uh, including both the names and the values. And then for the optimization history, here we apply the normalizations and try to convert everything into single digits or uh, single integers. So for example, for a parameter values, if it's a real or integer, we first apply the normalization according to its parameter range. And then uh, so that the value becomes zero to one. And if it's categorical parameter, we define it the value as the integer in the, dis in the discrete set of values. Then we convert the, the real numbers, uh, we discretize that into a thousand beans. Uh, so every prompt value is represented by some integer from zero to 999. Uh, similarly for the observed function, the performance metric, we also normalize it into zero up to one and then convert it into a single integers. So everything is represented as integers. And then now instead of have instead of uh, like a structureless data, um, data, now every tuning task can be represented as a sequence of integers. Um, so if we can learn the kind of using the applying the chain rule and learn the conditional distribution of generating the next token conditioned on all the past history, then we learn a generative model for this tuning task. For this generative model, when we look at the conditional distribution of, bit of generating the next green token, so it, it corresponds to the prime value condition on all the past metadata and past observation. This corresponds to predicting what an algorithm, uh, so all these data was generated by some optimization algorithm in the past. So if we can learn this distribution, prior distribution to generate the data, it means our model learns what the the algorithm that generated this data would do. So it's kind of learning the behavior policy that generated this data. That is to learn the conditional distribution of predicting the next parameter dimension P, uh, P condition on all the past observations. Then for the red token, it's to predicting the corresponding function value conditioned on all the metadata, the optimization history, and also the current set of parameter values. So that allows us to learn a, a probabilist model for the black box function we want to optimize, conditioned on a few observations we have collected so far. Uh, so since everything is converted into sequence, we are free to choose any sequence models for this kind of data. And our, our choice is a I'm transformer. Yep. So looks like, um, can you go back one slide? Yeah, so the two function, two probabilities you're trying to model, the first one probably is intrinsically sequential. Uh, sorry, a slide after, uh, one slide more. Yeah, this one. Um, so the first one is probably intrinsically sequential. To learn the policy, you do need to know the trajectory of things that people have tried. But then the second one, do we need it to be sequential at all? Because if you're trying to predict the function value, you just need to know a, a collection of function values. That's true. So the so the order probably does not matter. Yeah, it's just the way we we train our we train our model to predict 
that like in principle you can also randomly permute the all the observations. It doesn't. It should not matter uh, to predict the next function value. Yeah. So in practice, do you guys handle these two differences um, somehow? Yeah. So we we I did try to do some like data augmentation and randomly permuting the observation CJ three. It doesn't provide much improvement. So I would just like, resort to the easier solution to use the use it as the existing data. But because in the training data, we also include some data generated by random search. So in that case, all of the observation is also probably random already. So by including that, we allow uh, the model to probably like look, predict the, the function value condition on some like random order of observations. I see. Does your model have positional encoding at all? Yeah, it does have in precision encoding because that's important to keep the relative location of the all the parameter token in the same trial. Otherwise, it will not know like which token belongs to the same trial or not. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope everyone is like most people are sort of like familiar with the transformer or like, have uh, like basically knowledge about this one. So I will try. Give just like brief introduction. So uh, the transformer is a deep neural network that consists of like stack a stack of blocks where every in every block uh, there are the most important layer is this multi uh, head attention layer that allows uh, for every location in a sequence and it, uh, it allows the model to pay attention to all the locations uh, to all the tokens in the in the entire sequence. So in and so compared to a sequential or recurrent neural network that has to learn, look at like neighboring tokens, this allows you to pay, to apply the attention to some tokens far away uh, from the current location. So this model has the encoder decoder architecture where the encoder is the left stack that in, uh, take the, some input sequence as input and the compute a sequence of embeddings. Then that's, provi that's provided to the decoder part, where for the decoder, it predicts one token at a step in this recurrent like autoregressive way um, at test time. For our uh, hyperparameter tuning task, we define the input sequence as all the, mm, the token converted from the metadata. And the output, the input to the decoder is a target sequence. That is the sequence of the optimization history. Uh, we want the model to learn to model. And then uh, the multi attention head in this decoder part will pay attention to all the locations in both the metadata and all the observations um, it has seen so far up to the current step. Uh, in order to, to let the model only look at the history instead of the future, then we apply this masked multi head attention. That means when we compute the, the output for the current step, it can only have the attention for the past, not into the future. Then compared to recurrent neural network, the transformer, we, we choose transformer because it can uh, naturally uh, handle both the text and numbers in a unified way once we convert everything into tokens. And also I think recent literature in all different kinds of areas have shown that transformer is very powerful and uh, often better than a recurrent neural network. So that's why we start with the optiformer model, uh, with the transformer model. So we call our model as optiformer. It's basically applying uh, existing T5X transformer mod architecture to the hyperparameter tuning data structure. And by applying this transformer, we can learn both the probability to propose the next set of parameters one dimension by uh, at a step, and also to predict the corresponding function value given all the metadata, observation histories, and also the current set of parameter. So <clears throat> compared to many uh, other transfer learning approach based on Gaussian process, we just use one big deep learning models to model all the, the, all the policies and also function regression abilities. So um, it, it's also commonly known as black box approach to this meta learning approach method. Uh, once we train this model at the test time, we just predict, we just sample the parameter value from our model given all the his observation history 
one uh, parameter at a time. For example, at the beginning of the optimization, we only know the uh, tuning task name and the set of hyperparameter configurations, then the, and also the metric. The model will propose the first set of parameter. The first, uh, it will first propose the learning rate condition on the value of the learning rate. It will sample the choice of the opt form, uh, the optimizer's type, and then we send we send this set of hyperparameters to a model training um, component. Then after training, we observe the model's performance. We provide all of these uh, information inside uh, back to the sequence input sequence then ask the model to propose the next set of parameters. Learning, training the optimal on the data is, uh, it's a kind of quite standard way to, uh, to do using supervised learning. Uh, so we try to, given a sequence of optimization trajectory, we want the model to learn to predict every token sequentially conditioned on all the uh, data it has observed. Uh, for example, in this case, when we look at uh, the output of the for the green token, it's conditioned on the metadata history and also the partially generated parameters for the current trial. The model needs to learn to predict the, the distribution of the uh, the last dimension of the parameter. So, because we try to imitate what the the behavior policy, the, so by behavior policy, I mean the algorithm that's generated this optimization trajectory. We try to teach the model to learn this behavior policy. It's also commonly known as a behavioral, uh, behavioral cloning in the re uh, reinforcement learning literature. Then in this model, like the, uh, the model will output a vector of logics for every step. And then we convert the list of logics into a discrete distribution that's used to predict the parameter value for the current step. As, because the data also includes the function value, so we also include this auxiliary task to predict the function value, the red tokens for all these steps corresponding to function value tokens. So all the motivation of this project is to learn the prior, a better, uh, a better function value prior and also the policy from data. So it matters like what kind of data we can use to train the model. Uh, so the first data set we use is the, the, uh, the collection of optimization trajectories collected by Vizier by tuning real machine learning experiments. Um, because we don't have the, the algorithm that generates this experiments changes over time and we don't have very precise, precise uh, information about what algorithm it is. So we need to consider this data set as a trajectory is generated by a mix of algorithm that can probably change over time. Uh, beside this, we also consider two synthetic data set. Uh, the first one is the HPOB data set. That it, in this HPOB benchmark, they provide a surrogate models. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's random forest models fitted to the experiments released on OpenML platform. Those are the pairs of the hyperparameter values to the model metric uh, information. Then the another, another uh, set of benchmark function is the BBOB data set. That is a list of about 24 families of synthetic functions that was used for uh, testing the black box optimization benchmark. Then for both, because they only provide surrogate models, we want to get a sequence of optimization trajectories so the way to generate data for our model is that we run the run seven different hyperparameter optimization algorithms and use all of them to generate the tuning trajectories. So the list of algorithm uh, ranges from simple grid search to very complicated uh, Bayesian optimization algorithms. Then we also apply a few data augmentation met methods in order to reduce the overfitting. When the model is trained, at the test time, in order to get a real uh, hyperparameter optimization policy, uh, the most straightforward way to do it is that because we do the uh, we learn the policy by proposing the uh, by sampling the parameters. So at the test time, we can just like, sample the parameter value one dimension at a time. Uh, because this is the distribution we learned from the data, uh, we also call it we call it the prior policy because it's the prior distribution we learn about parameter generation. 
Um, it's also the behavior cloning method because all the model is trained to imitate the, the, the organization algorithm that generated the data. So at the test time, we sample one primary dimension at a time, then conditional on the newly sampled value, we sample the next dimension. Because for behavioral cloning, we can only do as good as the algorithm we learned. We can never do any better than existing hyperparameter optimization method. So in order to get a better policy, we also want to make use of the, the, the ability we learned to predict the function value, y given x. So that's the next uh, set of uh, policies we propose. We call it the augmented policy. So it's a basically based on a very simple trick that we first sample, repeatedly sample multiple candidates of the parameters for the next trial from the prior policy. Then we define, a, uh, we define an acquisition function based on the proposed candidates. And then you rank all the samples according to the acquisition function, then pick the one with highest uh, value. So because our model provides a distribution of the Y conditional on X, that's what uh, that's just the same as the output a Gaussian process would provide. So any acquisition functions developed in the literature based optimization can be used in our case. So we have a choice of different acquisition functions we can use. All of these can be used to to judge the quality of the parameter proposal. Compared to the standard Bayesian optimization, people usually don't have this prior policy. All they want to do is that given a, an acquisition function, they want to search in the entire parameter space to find the optimal parameter. And in contrast, mm -hmm. what we do is to find the optimal parameters in the subset proposed by the prior policy. So how well it really works. Um, so in order to assess the performance of our model, we look at three things. The first one is the, the pure parameter prediction. That's the ability for the model to predict the green tokens, the parameter tokens. Because we are doing the behavior cloning, we want to check whether the model can really learn different hyperparameter optimization algorithms faithfully. So uh, in order to control what algorithm we want to imitate, uh, because we encode all this meta information about the algorithm in the metadata or in, so that, that's provided at test time as the prompt to the, and to the transformer model. So all we want to do is to change the name of the algorithm in the meta, metadata sequence. Then the transformer will recognize the name of the algorithm and then behave differently. So we compare the distribution of proposing the next parameter dimension um, to uh, target policy the optiformer is designed, uh, is trained to imitate. We can see the, the density of proposing the, the parameter value X um, because it's a soft distribution, uh, it's a soft max distribution. So we draw many samples and then compare the histogram of the parameter samples with the target policy. You can see like they match very, they match very well with the target policy. Here is the plot for all the seven algorithms we, uh, we imitate. There's small like differences for some algorithms. Usually like it's most difficult to learn the GPUCB algorithm used by the VZIA service. But like in overall, I think we have very good match of all the uh, algorithms to the imitated policy. Then secondly, when we use this prior policy to tune the real kind of some test functions, um, we plot so every plot here is the curve of the best observed function value as a function of the, uh, the optimization step or the, called the trial. Then we try, we sam randomly sample 500 uh, different random functions to optimize and run each of them for hundred steps. Then we plot the mean performance, the mean and the standard deviation of this best observed function. We can see the distribution of this function uh, matches very well be between the Optimal, the imitated optimum policy and the target policy, both for regularized erosion and the hill climbing. And also, uh, we here we plot the mean and standard deviation of the best function we can find after a hundred steps. Then we also we compare for all the seven algorithms. Um, ideally, the algorithm should have the mean 
a line on the diagonal line, that means our model just performs exactly the same with same like variance with the target algorithm. Uh, all the algorithm are performed like match very well except for the Vizier algorithm. So the Vizier algorithm is the Bayesian optimization algorithm. It's also the most complicated algorithm among all these seven uh, seven ones. But you can see there is small gap, a small difference. But still, like when we prompt the model with the GPU CB algorithm, it's still the best performing algorithm among all of these seven imitated policies. So, so that was for evaluating the performance of predicting the parameters. Now we also want to look at how well the model can learn to do this few short function prediction by predicting the, the Y value or the F value condition on a few, a few observations and also the current set of hyperparameters. We compare it with the GP and uh, basically look at the, the log likelihood of predicting a new point and also the, the, whether the, the distribution matches the real function or whether we have a good uh, calibration of the uncertainties for our function predicting. We find that uh, the Octoformer indeed has a better uh, log likelihood and also calibration performance than GP in the test functions of both the VCD set and also the HPLB, the public HPLB benchmark. Um, Another metric we use to evaluate the calibration is that we look at the estimated CDF of the Y value. So if our if one model can predict the, the distribution of some random variable accurately, then the corresponding CDF should be subject, be subject to a uniform distribution from zero to one. So that is, then we can just basically plot the histogram or the cumulative histogram of the estimated CDF of the observations. Ideally, it should be a straight line, a straight diagonal line. So how the closer to the diagonal line means the better calibration we provide, we can obtain. And then in this plot, you can see the optimal is a lot closer to the diagonal line than GP. So lastly, when we combine the ability to predict the the parameter values and also the predicted function values. We want to see whether the augmented behavior policy, the augmented policy can, how, how well it performs compared to all other existing Bayesian optimization methods. We look at the two uh, set of test functions. One is on the HPLB data set. For the HPLB data set, the test function share the same search space as the training function. So the, opt the function we want to optimize in the test case is very similar to the function in the training case. Uh, we consider it as in-domain transfer, where the, the knowledge about hyperplane tuning is very close between the train and test scenarios. And in the VCD set or the real world data set, the, every tuning task is, uh, could have a very different set of hyperparameters, different dimensions and, and, and the type of parameters. So the test function is, could be very different from the, the distribution of the training functions. Uh, we consider it as an ultimate domain transfer problem. Uh, so for the HPO, so we consider, so here I first plot a few simple baselines, including the random search, the, our own implementation of the GPU CB algorithm, and also Vizier, uh, so the VCA algorithm is a variant of GPU-CB with additional tricks to, st to make it stable for basically a, a, wide, uh, a wide range of tuning tasks. It, also, it has the transformation method included in the GPU-CB method. Uh, it's also the algorithm used in production of Google service. Uh, so for HPLB paper, they also include another two baselines, the GP and uh, deep GP method in our plot. Um, for HPLB, there are some existing transfer learning literatures that applies the GP methods to do transfer learning, and they can apply only to the in-domain transfer scenario where the search space is exactly matches exactly matches the test case, but cannot on the uh, cannot apply that to the ultimate domain case. So we also include those baselines in the HPLB plot. So we first look at how how well it performs for the Optformer's uh, behavior cloning uh, policy, you can see that it does better than random search and then also like does comparably or even better than the, uh, our GPU CB implementation, but it's clearly worse than the VCA algorithm is supposed to imitate. 
But then when we augment our behavior policy with the acquisition function, so here we use the expected improvement as the acquisition function, there's a big boost in the performance. So that means like the including the information about the function prediction is very useful in our case. And indeed it has the best performing, uh, performing uh, capabilities in both the in-domain transfer and the out-of-domain transfer. Uh, so in the out-of-domain out transfer case, I think it's very close. It's slightly better, but like probably it's more fair to say it's like comparable with the Bezier algorithm in general. Um, can, can I ask a question? Sure. So why is behavior cloning itself so much worse? Didn't we see before that it was exactly matching the algorithm that you were trying to imitate? Um, yeah, so here actually, I think the prior policy is not that bad. So it's comparable with the GPU-CB algorithm. Um, in, in the previous slide, I think we show it's slightly worse than GP, but not by a lot. Uh, it's probably the scaling issues because here, when we compare with like, with all the other kind of latest algorithms, they are all very well performing. So we just zoom in, and you can see the clear gap between the prior policy and the, and the vizier. So, I think the difference there is not that big. Like to be honest. Um. Okay, I forgot. Are we comparing the value, the function value, or are we comparing? the policy performance? Uh, we compare the best observed function value. So that, that's used to measure the, the, the optimization performance. Okay. I see. Yeah, but I think it still shows that the, our imitated policy is still not able to catch up with the, to imitate the, the GPU-CB, the, the VCS GPU-CB method very accurately. That's the, the green one. So the yeah. red VC was trying to imitate the green one. Yeah. Um, I see. And the augmented version is when you run all kinds of algorithms and pick the one that's that's performing. So for the augmented algorithm, I, I prompt the model with the GPUs V. So it's the same uh, prior policy to propose multiple candidates. Then we rank the candidates according to the acquisition function defined by the optimal as well. And then we pick the can one the candidate with highest uh, acquisition value. Right. Um, is the acquisition function also a transformer? Yes, yeah, so the acquisition function is defined based on the prediction for Y. So right. the behavior policy only look at predicting X mm -hmm. and then conditional on the generated X, we can predict how, what will be the, the function value of, uh, given this candidate. Then we sort all the candidates according to how well it can get a, a potentially better uh, function value. So all of these are provided by the transformer. See. Cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so because this is quite different uh, algorithm for hyperparameter optimization, we, and there are multiple components in this algorithm, we really want to understand like the contribution of each component. Uh, so we did, we did a few ablation, policy, uh, ablation studies. The first thing we do is the, on the training data. Um, then you know, the, the, uh, the main algorithm is trained, the main model is trained on all the, the union of all the three data sets. So then we want to see if we train our model on a single data set, how well it can perform. We all we did all the ablation studies on the HPLV data set in this uh, in this talk, but we also have the results, uh, ablation results for the physical data set. The, the 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 observation is very similar. Like here, we are just only show the result for HPLV. So in this case, when we train on the uh the, on the purple curve, that is, we train our optimal on the data generated for from the BVOB data set. That's used for the black box optimization. Um, that's the most broad domain we can we can think of. Then uh, it's it performs reasonably, but still like there's a big gap from this to our like best model. Then when we train our model on the still out of domain, but on hyperparameter optimization data, then you can see a clear um, imp improvement in the performance, and if it comes comparable with the uh, uh, transfer learning uh, 
GP-based algorithm type of BO. Then when if we train our model using the same the data from the same data set, the same uh, HPLB data set, then the performance is improved further. And then when we train the model with all the data combined, we can see there's still improvement by the additional training data, even though the data can be quite different from the in-domain data. And uh, we, we have seen that, um, so uh, I think one of the like the starting point for our project is that we want to make use of the existing metadata in the data, uh, in the tuning experiments, including the name of the experiment, the name of the hyperparameters. So we want to see like whether the model really learns to make use of those metadata. So what we do is that we, um, at test time, we remove as much metadata as possible and only keep those like most important and necessary uh, metadata in the in the prompt. Then we see how it performs. Uh, it, it performs. So when we look at so we get variant called optimal mean. When we look at the prior policy, it just perform almost almost the same as the optimal's prior policy. This is actually uh, expected because. Uh, we train our prior policy to imitate the, the behavior policy and the behavior policy never uses the metadata at all. So the, the prior policy is not supposed to do anything different whether we provide the metadata or not. So that's, that's why the, these two solid lines are matching each other. And when we augment the prior policy with the, the acquisition function, we can see there's a clear improvement uh, no matter whether we use the metadata or not. But if we use the metadata, that's the dashed red line. It's always better than using minimum metadata in the, that's the orange dashed line. And uh, another thing just, is- Just wondering what if we use more metadata than that we're trained with? With more, so, the red line uses the, as much metadata as possible, but if we could provide more, maybe it could like get better information. So hopefully we can like- So as much as possible as in those that you trained with, what if at inference time, you just add more information to the transformer as metadata, even though they've never seen it during training? Um, well, at test time, the, the information is also never- observe like for every new test experiment, a tuning experiment, we can uh, we can tell them the new set of hyperparameters and the metric name. It could be unseen during training. Um, uh, so all these lines are, so you retrained the whole transformer with minimum metadata? I thought you were just doing inference. I'm uh, just doing inference. This is only inference. So the red curve is use all the metadata available to okay. test. test. Yeah, so I, I was just asking randomly, what if we add some more things to the metadata, even though they've never seen, I don't know, just yeah. random words. Um, no, it's an interesting question. I, I, I don't know. Maybe we can tell more, like for every, any new function, we can type in like more text about like what model it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see how it performs. Yeah. Or maybe the, if there's a way to give feedback after each proposed um, proposed hyperparameter, there's in the middle, you can add a pseudo metadata that gives feedback saying, saying I don't like the set of parameters that was, that were just proposed. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Some um, kind of human in the loop. Hyperparameter. Yeah, yeah, we can put the human back in the loop. Then, <laughs> yeah. First, first take them out and then put them back. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, because like, I think for transformers, like prompting engineering is an important task. So okay. how, to, how to let people to design the prompts is also important. Yeah, agree. Okay, so we have seen that like you, including the acquisition function. So the ability to predict the function value is very important to get the, the performance boost. So then one might, Doubt like whether the prior policy is useful at all. So in this ablation task, we consider two variants. So the red dash line is the the optimal's actual the augmented policy we have shown in the past. The blue dash line is that instead of like 
sample a few sample, uh, parameter candidates from prior policy. We just randomly sample those candidates uniformly in the search space and then rank with the execution function. Then that's the blue line. So we can show, see that it still improves upon the prior policy or a random search policy, but it's not as good as using as ranking the sample from the prior policy. And another thing we do is that instead of like search in the, in the subset of the candidate, sample of the candidates, we just run the global search to optimize this acquisition function defined by Optiformer and ignore the prior policy at all. We can see that um, after like doing like running the global search with like 6,400 evaluations, the performance is still just like the same as augmented policy uh, that based on ranking 100 samples from the prior policy. So that I think that suggests that the prior policy is indeed useful. It provides a small set of samples where you, you know with high confidence that a good candidate will be on this subset. So it provides a lot faster way to search in the search in the parameter space to find a good candidate. And then lastly, um, we, we want to study like whether the, any type of acquisition function is important for the optimal former. We find that all the like any type of acquisition function we tried uh, help the help improve the performance. And the difference between the choice of acquisition function is not that big. It's probably not statistically significant to, to say to claim that one particular acquisition function is better than the other for our optiformer model. So in summary, so we, we present the first step to train a universal transformer model for hyperparameter optimization from a large scale of data sets with all different kinds of tuning tasks. Then this provides a, a unified interface for tuning experiment data that, that contains vast different search spaces and with free form of task, task, description, sorry, task descriptions. Um, we show our model can imitate seven fundamentally different high point optimization accuracies. And then it also provides a well calibrated performance to predict the function value. Um, so with the, by combining both the parameter prediction and function prediction, the augmented policy provides a competitive performance um, on unseen test functions compared to existing long tried GP based models. Um, this is a very flexible framework and we just do the first attempt, uh, try to apply that to learn a universal hyperparameter tuning optimizer. So there are a lot of, there are still kind of a few limitations and a lot of space for future extension. For example, our model, um, probably I should say for the inches the limit, I should probably just go it quickly, sorry. Um, So currently it's a flat search space. So that means our, uh, we cannot do the conditional search space, like depending on the choice of optimizer, it can have different high choice of hyperparameters. So, sorry about that. Um, so we want to extend that to conditional search space. And also uh, currently it only does the sequential optimization, but the batch optimization is important in practice. And also we want to go beyond the behavior cloning by using more sophisticated method to improve the current behavioral policy. Uh, this model is also compatible with multi-objective optimization. So that could also be a use, interesting future work to explore. And there are a lot of more ideas for future ex extensions. So for the takeaway message, we can now let the transformers to learn the hyperparameter optimization from all possible data we have collected in the past. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, we can leave the remaining time for Q&A and maybe I'll just start with a question that uh, if the value prediction is so accurate, maybe from now on, we just, we don't need to train any model at all. We can just ask the Transformer, if I were to train a ConfNet on CIFAR with this set of parameters, was the expected accuracy? Are we already there? Yeah, 
that, that's the dream, I would say. So that means like we, we learn really good prior that we can do zero shot guessing like without any observation. I think our model can show that it does well. Like once we observe a few observation, it can make a sort of accurate prediction and the accuracy improves with more and more observation. If we don't have any new observation, we can make some rough guess, but I don't think it's good enough yet to, to suggest the optimal kind of set of hyperparameters. Cool, anyone um, has a question can speak up. I just wanna follow up on that question um, about the nature of the problems. Uh, if that's changing, do you think that uh, the value of this would, um, I guess, not come in as as much when new problems or new goals are set by the machine learning model as a whole? So what do you mean by the, the nature of problem changes? So if, if you're using similar techniques, but to solve a new problem that isn't in the training data set, um, I guess that's where I would think that this would have a limitation, um, like yeah, I something guess. that we're talking right now with machine learning models that wouldn't be in the data set if that eventually becomes a goal. Um, yeah, I think one day if we come up with a brand new like architecture or a completely different machine learning model and we want to tune hyperparameters, probably this model is not gonna give like better information than uh, I don't know, like a GP would do. Um, but I still, I think like, because even if the model architecture is the same, the choice of hyperparameter or the optimizer might still use the same. If we still use SGD or Adam, maybe we can still transfer that the knowledge of how to tune those hyperparameter for the optimizers. And if if the, the optimizers, if we come up with new optimization algorithm, but the model is diff, is almost the same, then we can still transfer the knowledge about the like, model's hyperparameter. So unless there's a kind of complete jump of kind of like to a complete new domain, then I think there can be still be a kind of continual transfer learning uh, work. And also we collect data all the time, so we can consider that as a continual learning project. Right. Um, I wonder in those cases, if we are facing a brand new task um, that model was never trained on, maybe we can just swap out the first few instances uh, from, from Fuchsia to actual data. So when you select the two hyperparameters, when you fit in the, the accuracy, you fit in the actual one that you're running the training. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. So we can, we can do the test time adaptation, like when we observe like 10, like we we observe 10 uh, data points, we can fine tune our transformer model so that it fits to the test function uh, better. I, th I think that would be a useful extension to do. Like that should be, that should be useful. Um, there are some questions about like, whether, like how to choose the hyperparameter to tune the, to do the fine tuning, how many steps we need to run. But I think in general, uh, people studied the transfer learning, the GP based transfer learning has shown test time adaptation is useful. So I think it should apply to transform as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a raised hand from Danny. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I had a question, had a question regarding uh, data augmentations. Have you tried the, for say images, have you tried the op format of, on figuring out what data augmentations to use? Uh, Oh, you mean the data augmentation for image models? Yeah, or any, yeah, because sometimes some augmentations hurt performance for certain data sets and sometimes it works. Um, have you tried off former to find data augmentations to use? Uh, no, not yet. I think that's something very interesting to see. But okay. I think usually like, so the optimal Former, it's, it's not doing kind of just guess without any observation. It, it's one way to design the policy such that we can collect more observation and try different set of, uh, of, uh, of hyperparameter values. And then hopefully it can find the optimal value for, uh, eventually. So we will still need to, like some real observations in order to get a, a more better and better suggestion. Okay. Thank you.
Jeff? Um, it looks to me uh, by scanning the paper that the number of iterations is held constant. Is that true? The number of iteration you mean at the test time? Yes. Uh, we tested up to 100 iterations. It can also, you can also run it for 200. So, so it's actually limited by the memory limit of running the transformer. Um, yeah, so it actually the, the maximum sequence we can handle depends on the dimension of the parameter. If you are tuning the task for like two or three hard parameters, you can probably go to 200 or 300 iterations. I see. Thank you. You answered the, both the question of is how many there were and also what the rationale behind it. That, that was my second question. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'll jump in with a question. I Sorry if I missed something. So for the EI uh, approach, I'm, my understanding is that you use the transformer to generate a suggestion. You test what that accuracy would be. You ask it what that accuracy would be. Then you throw it away, ask it another suggestion, test what that accuracy will be, uh, and, and so on, and then choose the best of those. Do you find that there's much value in using it to suggest those, to output those suggestions? Uh, in some cases, could you just generate, like, just do a, just do a very, very, like, thorough grid search of the entire space, if, if that's plausible? Do you find that there's much improvement from using its suggestions? Yeah, that's actually one of the ablation study I showed in the study. I see. So, I'm sorry about that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. On our archive paper, actually, we didn't include that, but like in this slide, we have, sorry, my computer almost broke this. So uh, in, in one slide, it shows if we do global search at every step to optimize the EI, the performance is almost the same as just like rank and find the, uh, the best sample from 100 samples. So, yeah, in this slide. So the global search, the, the purple line is to do the kind of brute force search in the entire search space. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat about what scale is this model run at? By scale, they're asking amount of parameters and compute. Yeah, so currently our model is trained with up to so we, uh, we trained with a sequence up to kind of 1,024 tokens. That, that means like for every trial, it includes the dimension of the parameter and also the function. So roughly it's kind of D plus one uh, times the number of iterations. So for 20 parameters, you can, uh, at, at inference time, we extend the sequence to 2,000. But as, as long as you have like big enough memory, you can just, increase the length of sequence it can run um, like within this memory limit. Uh, we, we just tried with up to 100 in the test, uh, in test and with the parameter dimension up to 21, I think that's probably the most commonly used range of the hyperparameter values, uh, hyperparameter dimensions. Uh, I think there are a lot of more memory efficient variants of the uh, transformer architectures like the performers. In that case, it's linear to the, uh, it's linear to the sequence length. I, I guess we can extend it to a much longer sequences. Another question from the chat, any ETA for the universal hyperparameter and a black box optimization interface, um, which was alluded from the blog post, it looks like. Uh, interface. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, Shantanu, if you want to clarify what you meant. The, yeah, Eugene, in the blog post, uh, there was mentioned an interface that was to be shared. I think it's in the works, perhaps. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I think we are, we are considering uh, to open source our code, so it will also include the uh, converter that basically uh, it's based on the open source the Vizier, uh, interface, Vizier studies data structure. So if you can write your uh, tuning, tuning data structure in the Vizier's protocol buffer, the data structure, they can be converted into the data like uh, input to our transformer. So 
basically it's just I I guess if you can write it with JSON, then you can convert it into sequence and that can be consumed by the optimal model. So are the model uh, are the model weights also going to be public? Uh, we are planning to open source the code trained on public data set uh, because there's kind of privacy issues with using the, the internal data. So we are not allowed to open source that part. Uh, another thing you've, you've uh, so there's like in this approach, there's the, like in this slide, there's the, uh, the opt former and opt former after EI, which is expected improvement, right? Yeah. Is there, have you tried uh, retraining the opt former to imitate its own policy after expected improvement? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I'm thinking about that. So I think it will be a very useful extension to, to further improve. improve. It's, it's, it's a bit like the alpha zero algorithm where you have a policy, then you use the, your policy to generate new data and then train a new model. So I, I expect it could it kind of improve the, part, the model. Yeah, I think there's also like a very recent paper about using transformers for, for video games or something, and they show it's quite a data efficient. Uh, I think it maybe it was released yesterday or even today. Uh, transformers are sampled efficient world models. I see, I see, thanks. Yeah, I, I will check that out. Let's see. Ah, maybe another thing. Uh, do you think it would improve things if uh, you started with a pre-trained uh, large language model like a GPT? Yeah, it's possible, I think. So that's also some useful extension to try uh, because if we train with uh, pre-trained models, it can probably understand the semantic meaning of the hyperparameters and also the task description better. So it could be a useful thing to try. Especially when a lot of the information was encoded just with language. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, speaking of, I, I was puzzled by this converting everything to integer part. Do you mean just like an index that eventually is in embedding lookup? Yeah, so right now we just convert that into index. So integer is the index in the vocabulary. Okay. So like those numbers, like the integers uh, discretized, like no normalized number is from zero to 999. Those are corresponding to one kind of token one entry in the vocabulary. Right, so the alternative would be just reading the float number as a string. Yeah, uh, so I, I think transformer is still kind of hard to understand like real number representations. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we start with that, uh, to be honest, like from our project, mm -hmm. but it, it's finding it hard, a lot harder to train also because for a float number, you will need multiple tokens to represent represent one number. Then that will limit how many trials you can absorb in one model's training. So then later we decided to in, to encode it in with a single token. But I think if the then model can the output is it also the single token or is the, yeah, output, the output is also the single token? So okay. it's the normalized product value in its range. That's interesting. Okay, a final question from anyone? Uh, yeah, regarding this part about the token being uh, like a single token, for example, eight, seven, six, uh, how do you calculate the loss compared to the actual, like if the transformer outputs eight, seven, six, but the real answer was eight, seven, seven, the two tokens are very different to each other, but they are close in. Yeah, we, uh, so we, we consider it as a multi-class, like, uh, as a classification problem. So 877 will be a different value as 876. Uh, um, but we do include the data augmentation, so randomly scaling the, the function value. 
So the model actually learns a smooth distribution in the range, although like we consider it as a multi-class classification problem. Oh, okay. So the loss is still like very high, but by smoothing it will tend to, to give a range of things, okay. Yeah, because we have this data augmentation. So for this one, like uh, training instance, it misses it, but for the next instance, it will exit it. So the output distribution is a very smooth uh, function uh, distribution over the, the, the value range of the function. Thanks for the presentation. Maybe a final question from whoever hasn't spoken yet. Okay, looks like no. Great. Um, thanks, Yutian, for the presentation. And thanks, everyone. Enjoy your weekend, your long weekend if you're in the US. See you thanks. next week. Thanks for the invitation again. <laughs>